Good morning. If you'll stand and turn in your hymnals to 11, we'll sing Come Thou Fount, number 11. Come thou fount of every blessing, to thy heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues of fire. Please this name I've fixed upon it, things of God's redeeming love. Hitherto thy love has blessed me, thou hast brought me to this place, and I know thy hand will bring me safely home by thy good grace. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, bought me with his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, Bind my wandering heart to Thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Is my heart, O oh, take and seal it. Seal it for Thy courts above. You'll turn to the inside of your bulletin for our call to worship from Psalms chapter 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. The Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to come into your house on this beautiful Sunday morning. We ask that you would take our praise and our worship and that it would be a sweet-smelling incense into you. We ask that you would bless everyone that's not here, God, that you'd minister to them wherever they are, that you would meet their needs and give them mercy and encouragement. And for those of us who are here, God, we ask that you would challenge our hearts and our lives today that we would leave this place different. And we stop and we take this moment to say the prayer that you taught the disciples saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy as it was in the beginning, tis now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Also on the inside of your bulletin, we'll say this confession together. Heavenly Father, 
we praise you for adopting us as your children and making us heirs of eternal life in your Son, Jesus Christ, who has freed us from our sins by his blood, yet we still fail to love with all our heart or serve you as we ought. Pardon our offenses, we pray, and make us clean, that we may continue as members of Christ, in whom alone is salvation. Amen. If you'll turn your hymnals to page 10, we'll sing Majesty. If you've never sung this before, we'll sing the whole thing through and come back to the section that starts with So Exalt and sing that again. Majesty, worship his majesty, unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom authority, flow from his throne unto his own his anthem raise so exalt lift up on high the name of jesus magnify come glorify christ jesus the king Majesty, worship His majesty. Jesus who died, come glorified, King of all kings. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. Magnify, come glorify, Christ Jesus the King. Majesty, worship His majesty. Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to come into your house and just to approach your throne of grace boldly and to make our requests known. And so we, we stop in this part of our service, God, and we come before you with all these needs, but also with praise, and we just want to stop and say thank you. And thank you, God, also for the opportunity that we get that we can be here, that we can bring the needs of our friends and families before you, and we can just worship you. And so we thank you for that opportunity and the ability to do it freely. We pray for the three unspokens, God. You know exactly what's going on in those situations. You know every detail, and so we just place it in your hands and ask that your will would be done. We pray for the students, God, that are either going off to college, returning to college, returning to high school, middle school, grade school. Uh, we ask that you would minister to each and every one, that you would give them the ability to study, to show themselves approved, God, that they don't need to be ashamed and that they can stand up for you and God, we ask that you give them opportunities to share your love and your mercy every single day. We pray, God, for the floods in Louisiana and those that have been extremely affected. Lord, you know that there's many that have been, their homes just ruined, many that are hurt. And God, also I'm thinking about in Italy with the earthquake, God, and the death toll continuing to rise. And we ask, God, that you would meet the needs of those who've had their homes wrecked between these two different things, but also, God, that you would... Minister to the hearts and the lives, God, as they rebuild, as they restart, as they have to start from the ground up, but also, God, for those that have lost loved ones. God, I ask for your grace and your mercy, and that instead of this time looking at it as judgment and God came down and hated on them, but may they see it as an opportunity to share your love with others, God, who don't know you, and that it would be an opportunity to spread the gospel. And finally, Lord, we ask that you would bless the remainder of this service, God, and challenge each and every one of our hearts and lives. And we thank you for it, in Jesus' name, amen.
At this time, we'll continue our worship through giving. Thank you for this opportunity that you give us to give back to you with all the many blessings you've given us, God. We here in the U.S. are so privileged, so we thank you for that, and we ask that you take our gifts this morning, that they would meet the needs of this church, and that you would bless them to go above and beyond. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, beautiful, for spacious skies. For amber waves of green, for purple mountains, majesty above the fruited plain, America, America, God shed His grace on me. And crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining This morning's scripture reading is Psalm 8, which is found on page 848 in your pew Bibles. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants, 
you have ordained praise because your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This ends the reading. And now let us turn to page 633 and sing, Open Our Eyes, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, and we ask that you would take your word and that you would challenge our hearts and our lives this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Anybody been watching the Olympics now that they're over? Now that they're over, anybody gone and looked back at some things? So I saw something live I was pretty impressed with. Anybody see the two American divers that took a silver? Anybody see their interview afterwards? It was actually really impressive. Most times when athletes start talking about God, I cringe. I'm like, they're just going to do a bad job. They're going to stick whatever they're trying to put out there, out there. And it, it ends up being a bad testimony on God. The two American divers, if we could have, I would have played it for you this morning because it's really a minute and a half clip. I came in here earlier in the week and I tried to think if I could bring my TV in here and set it up to get you all to watch it, but I couldn't figure it out. So go home, YouTube it. It's impressive. What I will tell you is this morning we're going to talk about who am I. And one of the things that the divers talked about, you know, the, the reporter was trying to really stick it to them. You know, you didn't get a gold. Like, you, you know, how are you going to handle that? Like, you're not going back to the U.S. with gold. You've got these swimmers getting golds left and right, and the divers didn't pull it off. And the one guy steps right up and he says, my identity is not in the gold. My identity is in Christ. So they tried to pivot to the next one, and you really have to go watch it. And he just reiterates what the first one says, and they let it go. They didn't push anything. 
They didn't throw it in anyone's face. And I thought, what an amazing job. What a great way to, to show that off. So before we get too deep into the, into the study this morning, does anybody play fantasy football? OK. See this trophy? This is because I'm the champion at fantasy football. If you look, my name, it's right there. And it's, this is something to tote for a whole year. I'm the man. Now, you know what the loser gets, at least in ours? You get a dirty plate. You're not allowed to wash it. And you're stuck with it for the whole year. But this morning, what I want to talk about is that it's very easy to get lost in who we are. Right? I've played sports most of my life. In college, I, I did pretty well. I, I went from being a basketball player all through high school and things like that to having to play soccer because they told me I was uh, too short and I was white. Not really sure what all that means, but that's what they told me. So they said, go try out for soccer. So I tried out for soccer. The first year, I've never had so many splinters in my dairy air in my life. I'd never been benched before, and it was difficult. It was a defining me, and it really shouldn't have been, but it was. It's easier when you've got the cup that says you are the champion. It's easier, even if you're losing, if you were at least the starter who didn't make a mistake. So midway through my first year as a walk-on in D2 soccer in college, I end up starting. And here we are. We're away. We're at a conference finals. We get knocked out in the first game. Everybody's blaming everybody. And I remember being able to say, I didn't do anything wrong. I hung my hat on that. I was excited. Like, hey, listen, I was in position. I was where I was supposed to be. If you guys had all done your part, we wouldn't have lost. I'm not going to say that's 100% true. But we did go back and watch film. And sure enough, I was where I was supposed to be. I was a defensive slash outside mid. So in soccer, which I know is not a huge sport here in the US, but when you have defense, depending on how you're running your defense, and we played the German 4-4-2. If you know anything about all that, you'll understand it later. Um, we had the diamond in the back, and my job as a midfielder was to get back and cover the right corner. So they have on video, there's me, I get back, I cover the right corner, I take the man with the ball, I shut him down, I force him into the corner. What's supposed to happen is your, your sweeper should get in behind me and cover me. Never showed up. So they had somebody slice in. Because I'm low enough in the field, they are not offsides. He pops the ball up over my head, which is not difficult to do if you play soccer. It's a little, there goes the ball straight up in the air. And I can't get to it. They score. They win 1-0. It was maddening. As a college kid being young, it was defining. It was horrible. I hated it. I went into the summer. I was At that time, I was a, working with a church plant just north of Philadelphia in a town called Doylestown. And I spent one of the most hot summers of my life kicking a soccer ball. When I tell you hot, the pastor at the church, because he was very tied into the school I went to, said to me, he goes, I'm going to write a note to your coach about all the days you practiced when it was over 100 degrees. And my thought process was, I'm not going to get beat again. I just wanted to make sure we didn't get beat again, because it was defining. It was who I was. I was missing the part with the divers where they said, I don't find my identity in that sport. I find my identity in Christ. And this morning, we're going to look at the Psalms in chapter 8, and we're really going to focus in on the middle verses where in a, it says, we're going to look at verses 3 through 5. We'll get a little bit into 6, but... Let's start out with the beginning, right? It says in verse 1, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Think about God's name. Everybody knows it. Might not use it correctly. You might cringe when it comes out of certain people's mouths, but almost everybody knows the name of God. That's pretty big, right? Couldn't you go majestic with that? That's pretty crazy. And then it says that you have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praises because of your enemies to silence the foe 
in the Avenger. And here's the part I really want us to focus in on, verse 3. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? Who is the son of man that you care for him? Now stop and think about this. Think about, let's just use the, the, the uh, skies for a moment. Did you ever just stop and look up and just be amazed? You ever gone to the Omni Theater in Boston, the Museum of Science, when they're doing the outer space stuff and they just show you all these crazy, crazy things? You ever watch the Discovery Channel when they get into the galaxies? And you ever just go, wow, like, who did that? A little side note, for whoever creation you want to believe, I'll happily argue that it's God, okay? When I was on Wall Street, I had these guys that decided that since I was a pastor, and they were all science students, that they were going to show me that they're smarter than I am. So they were trying to prove the Big Bang Theory to me. I asked them a very simple question. If we took the correct neutrons, atoms, and, you know, two masses, large masses, and we got two rockets heading at each other, and they collided, could we create another bang and get an alternate universe? Every single one of them, including the professor in the room, said, don't answer, don't answer, don't answer, don't answer, don't answer. You can't answer that. One person wasn't smart enough to listen to them. You know what he said to me? No, we're not big enough. We're not powerful enough to create that. I said, perfect, so you still need God. You look at all of the universe. If you think there's no God, I think you're crazy. Because it's too vast. Think about it. The moon moves a little bit, and you can create a tsunami. Right? The sun's off just a little bit. It throws off all kinds of things in the earth. They have scientific studies that show when the moon's full, people do weird things because their equilibrium's off. I tell everybody, I can tell you it's a full moon just by the way people in Boston drive. Check it out next time. Just see if, see if there's a little truth to that. But what's crazy is that this is an earth that God created. And he created all of this. He created all this grandeur. He made something that works perfectly, a solar system that goes around the sun, that has planets traveling at different speeds in different directions all at the same time. And then all of that, right? He creates all of that. And you look at that, and we don't even know the galaxies that exist. We don't even know the true realm of what he created. And you know what's nuts? He then said, hey, I want a friend. Let's make man. Let's make him in, my, in our image. And the psalmist here is saying, you know, some of David, he's saying, when I look at all of that, how, how did God think of me? And when I look at all the grandeur, how did God think of my children? And to think that Jesus said, I care for you so much. I counted the hairs on your head. He sees every sparrow fall. Yet some of us, it's easier to count than others. But he sees every detail. Who are we? What makes him care about us? In the reality, if you look at the grand scheme, we're, we're not even this big. Anybody remember the Hoosiers movie? When he comes in the coach, and he's holding the basketball, and he takes a penny, puts one dot on it. He goes, that one dot represents how much you know about basketball. And this basketball represents how much I know. That's God. God is so big, we're not even a dot. And yet he cares about us. Yet he loves us. He says he wants to have relationship with us, right? In Revelation it says that, you know, he comes and he, he stands at the door and he knocks. And anyone that will open that door and let him in, he'll come in and he'll commune with us. And he'll have supper. In the, in the time when Revelation was written, what that means to have supper is that you're going to come in and you're going to sit down and you're going to talk over food, but you're going to get to know each other. 
It's going to be intimate. Okay, back in that time, it was very normal to be in the marketplace and to all sit at the same table, have nobody you know, you eat, you keep your mouth shut, you do your own thing. But when somebody showed up at your house, it meant I want to know you. And you get the option. You open the door or you don't. And Jesus Christ came, right, and he died for us so that he can open that door. And the psalmist, I think, really, he says it best when he says, who are we? When you stop and you look at the greatness of God, you look at all that he does, and to think he cares about us, to think he shows up in our lives on a daily basis. The question is, what do we do about it? Do we respond to it? Or do we just do our own thing? I think somebody's at the door. Ah, oh, you know what? I don't have time. I'm in the middle of... I, I don't play video games, so I don't even know what they are. Mortal Kombat? I don't know. I don't do enough video games, but whatever. I'm in the middle of something. I don't have time to answer that. That's the God who did everything for you. That's the God that's looking out for you. That's the one who charged his angels to protect you. Well, I don't have time for him. Can someone else get the door? I'm busy. One of the churches I used to preach at, we actually had somebody, and this is a true story, that thought that the pastor just spends all week praying, that's it, so they must be really in tune with God, and so therefore they didn't need to pray. You can say, oh, that sounds funny, but this person really believed it. My question is, how much of us know that's not true, but our actions say we believe that? When's the last time you took out a minute to, to spend time with God? Here he is, the God of the universe. He's created all this stuff. He cares about you so much. It goes on to say that you made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. We get a choice. That's our glory and honor. The angels, the cherubims, the seraphims, they have to do what they're created to do. Not to take away from them, but how would you like it if all you could do was fly around in the presence of God singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Throughout the Bible, we see that that happens. There's these cherubims and seraphims, that that's all they do. And yet God, who created all of this, who could have made us just to, that's it, you get to do just this, that I want a relationship with you, but I want you to open the door. Yeah, he comes and he finds us. He comes and he knocks on the door. His spirit draws us. We can see that throughout the Bible. But we have to respond to him. We have to look and say, you know what? I'm going to let go. I'm going to meet him. I'm going to get intimate. One of the first Sundays I spoke here was the, the children's chat. I think that's what you guys call it. And they had the teenagers doing the Lord's Prayer. And, and part of it was, well, you know, I got other things to do. What if God said that to us? One of my favorite movies of all time, if you ever want to understand the sovereignty of God, is Bruce Almighty. A little bit of a play on it. But one of my favorite parts, and most people miss this, it's when God lets him be God, right? Which obviously isn't going to be true. And so he's getting all these prayers coming into his head and he can't handle it. And he's going nuts and he goes, I can make this so efficient. Send out an email reply. Everything's yes. This is the part everybody misses. All of a sudden this person's screaming at God, I didn't really mean kill my mother. Right? Somebody, God, I wish you would just let my mom die. We're incapable of doing all God does. He's so vast and so mighty, and yet he cares about us. Why? Who are we? We get caught up in these little things, and, and I'll be the first to say I love sports. I love fantasy. I just did my second draft of the season last night. But 
Is that what defines me? Is my soccer ability, my athletic ability what makes me who I am? No. And three years ago, I got a real reality check. Three years ago, right now, I was sitting in a hospital waiting for an ablation because I had WPW and had a, a, a tachycardia arrhythmia that led to a heart attack. 30 years old, all my athletic ability, all my being in shape was gone. You know who was there with me the whole time besides my mom? God. You know how many lessons I learned during that period? It's tough when all of a sudden everything you stood for is wiped out from underneath you. My fiance and I were talking the other day and I said, I don't know how people make it through life without Jesus. You know what she said to me? You didn't always think that way. <laughs> oh, reality check, thanks. <laughs> but what are we looking at when we see God? Is he something we do on Sunday morning to ensure our into heaven? Which, by the way, that doesn't work, but you can ask me about that later. Is it what we do? We just, we got to go sit in church for an hour. Maybe give a little tithe. And that's it, we're all set. The God of the universe who wants to have a relationship with us, who's counted the hairs on our heads, he's mindful of us. What's he asking? He wants us to be his sons and his daughters. He wants us to rule and to reign with him. You know, last week we talked about the Good Samaritan and, and are we the person who walks on the other side? And I mentioned this, the quote that we're not powerful enough to, to ruin God's will. You know, sometimes we're like, oh, God, I screwed up so bad. And I said, you guys aren't, you're not powerful enough to actually pull that off. But how many times do we miss out? The priest, that Levite, they could have had an opportunity to do something for God and someone else got that opportunity. It's easy to say someone else will come along. Someone else will do it. But someone else can't have your relationship with God. Jesus made it very, very clear that he wanted a relationship with all of us. And then after he got the disciples and after he rose from the dead and he explained it all to them, what did he say to them? Go keep it to yourself. Don't share this with anybody. You guys are the select few. That's it. The rest are in trouble. Isn't that what happened to the Mormons? Right? They had a big problem back in 1998 because they had more than 144,000 followers and they misinterpreted that one scripture. And so they were like, what do we do? Do we shut people out? No, we need more money, so we should keep letting people in. So it must be more than 144,000. You know what's crazy? Jesus never said, only you guys. No, his very next words would go into all the world, tell everybody. You've got something. You actually figured it out. I care about you. I want a relationship with you. Don't keep it to yourself. Give it to the next person. You know, it's, it's crazy if you go to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, this scripture is brought up again. It talks about how Jesus came down to earth. He was, he was made lower in his status, right? He was, not, he was still the son of God, but he made himself a man so that he could live that perfect life and be that perfect sacrifice for us. And who are we? Who, where are we getting our identity? Is our identity in our abilities? As if it is, when you get to heaven, well, God, I won every championship. Shouldn't this get me into heaven? You laugh. But what do you think when you stand before God? What are you going to say? And I'll close with this. You don't want to be the rich man with Lazarus at the gate, right? He never helps out the guy and he gets, gets up to eternity and God sends him into eternity without him. And he calls out to Moses over the great divide, right? And he says, can someone go tell my brothers? Can somebody, so they don't deal with this, can somebody tell them this is actually real? Pastor Tim Schmidt of Calvary Chapel once said, if you really understood your identity in Christ, it what it meant, you would want everybody in the world to understand it as well. 
we knew who we were. We're sons, we're daughters of the almighty God. And all he's asking of us is a relationship. It's not difficult. He says, though, if we're ashamed of him, then the day we meet him, he'll be ashamed of us. Some days playing sports, you can make mistakes and you can be very ashamed of yourself. Other times you'll be very proud of yourself. But with God, there's nothing to ever be ashamed of. Think about it. They try and model computers after our very minds and our DNA because they're just so intricate. They're so impressive. They're so amazing what our human bodies can do. And God not only created that, he wants to have a relationship with us. I, I printed off a few of these. If anybody wants them, we can print off more. Actually, Nancy Cutter did it for me. It's 90 statements of who I am in Christ. Take these home if you want them. Read through them. Who are you in Christ? What are you? And it gives you the scripture verse with it. And it just tells you everything. I'm a joint heir with Christ, sharing in his inheritance with him. We're sons and daughters of the almighty God. Do we live and act like it? Sometimes. Or are we more proud of our own accomplishments? On my best day, everything that I did in sports, and I'll leave those there, and if we need more, we can print them, correct? Um, on my best day, I stand up to nothing that God did with everything he created. You know, the psalmist only took into account the heavens. But think about everything God did. We prayed this morning about a baby being born. Life's a miracle. Life's incredible. All that happens inside the female's body to build that baby, to protect it until the perfect time for it to come into this world, is amazing. And the same God who created all of that said, I want to have a relationship with you, and I want you to find your identity in me. I want you to be able to put on my righteousness. When you stand before me at the end of time and it has to come down to, you know, what can you account for? What can you say for all you've done? And you can look and say, I've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and because of that, I'm redeemed. I can be in front of God perfect and holy because of what he did, not because of anything I did. This morning, where do we find our identity? Is it in God, in Jesus Christ, in his death and resurrection? Or is our identity in ourselves? Is our identity in our ability to be the best paid, to be the best at whatever we do? And I can tell you this, in, in my experience since the heart thing and really putting myself where my identity was not about me because I was incapable about being me anymore, it's actually freeing. When you're not stuck trying to always be the best. Look at some of these athletes that were, I mean, I always only collegiate. I was nowhere near some of these other athletes. Michael Phelps eats 12,000 calories a day and spends six hours a day in the pool swimming. You put a lot of identity there. Do you know what else he's placing his identity in recently? Jesus. It happens he read The Purpose Driven Life and he realized he felt his life was useless. He said winning all those golds in Beijing did nothing for him. Why? Because his identity was in the wrong place. Because at the end of the day, that trophy does nothing for me. It let's me gloat. But honestly, it's no different than the dirty plate. When I stand before God, I can't hold up the trophy. When I stand here before you, I can't really hold up the trophy. If we all started following the trophy, we'd, we'd be screwed. We'd be in trouble. But if we put our trust and our hope and our identity in Jesus Christ, we have eternal life. 
Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to look at your word. And as the Psalm David said, who, who are we, God, that you took the time to actually care about us? Truthfully, Lord, we're nothing. But yet you love us so much, you sent your son to die for us, and you gave us heirs, joint heirs with Jesus, to be your adopted sons and daughters. And God, if we could just truly grasp what that meant, we would live life so differently. So this morning, I ask that you would challenge each and every one of our hearts and lives, that we would leave this place thinking about, where is my identity? Is my identity in my abilities? Is my identity in my accolades? Is my identity in my family name? Is my identity in my parents' money? Or is my identity in Jesus Christ? Lord, I ask that you just challenge every single one of our hearts and our lives, and may we look to you for our identity. And may we be willing to share you with others so they too can have eternal life. We thank you for this opportunity in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll stand with me and turn your hymnal to 31. 31. exalted far above all gods. For thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. We thank you for this day, and we thank you for this opportunity to just look at your word in chap Psalms chapter 8, God, where the psalmist reminds us that we are nothing without you. And God, you who created everything actually took time to want a relationship with us. And we ask that we would honor you in all that we do today and throughout this week. And we ask that your Holy Spirit be on our lives and that we leave this place challenged. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. 